desert land I tell myself keep walking on There's something up ahead Water falling like a song An everlasting stream Your river carries me home Let it flow, let it flow vicariously through some of you all that do have the rhythm to clap like that. So, But welcome this morning. We're glad you're here. Let's take a few moments, shake hands with those around us as we continue to worship God.
fountain I drink from Oh, it's my song Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my song You are good, good Oh, you are We thank you for your goodness towards us. Father, and as we sing the words, as we believe in our heart that you're never going to let us down, God, 
God, we know that you never change. But Father, sometimes we walk through situations in life that we don't understand, where we seem far from you. But Father, help us in those moments to remember that you are good and that you love us. Father, I pray that you'll be with us this morning as we open your word. Father, I pray that you will just speak to us. Father, I pray that as we listen to your word being preached, Father, that we will settle in our hearts your goodness and your lordship over us. Father, help us to come to that point where no matter what you ask of us, we are obedient to you, that we follow you, and that we give every aspect of our life to you. We pray that you'll be with us during this time. Pray that you'll be glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and open to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you today or if you don't own a Bible, you feel free to, to use the one that's provided there uh, in the, the, the rows. If you look under your seat or the seat in front of you, uh, there will be a hardback Bible there. And if you don't have one, you feel free to take that one and let that one be yours. Uh, we would love for you to be able to, to read it and to study it with us. Uh, but this morning we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 19 through about verse uh, 25. Uh, but as a uh, way of introduction, let me uh, share with you uh, a story from uh, a friend of mine in high school who came in uh, to our study hall one day, very excited that they had found the thing that they were going to do. They had found their niche. They had seen a commercial on television for the Peace Corps, and they were going to join the Peace Corps. Do you remember the Peace Corps? Anybody remember that? Uh, where they go around doing good things and, and they were for peace as far as I can tell. Uh, and and uh, we thought it rather odd that this person uh, thought was, that that was a great thing to do. Uh, and when we pressed them a little bit uh, more, they seemed convinced that that was going to be the thing that they did. When they finished high school, they were going to go and join uh, the Peace Corps. And, and so uh, one of us in the circle said, well, that's a great commitment uh, to do that for, for two years. And their countenance shrank, and they said, two years? I thought it was like a one, one week in a month, two weeks out of the summer kind of thing. And, and we thought, no, you're thinking of the, of the, the National Guard or the Army Reserve. Uh, the Peace Corps is a two-year commitment. And, and when, he, when he heard that, he was significantly less excited uh, about the idea of what he was going to do after school. He didn't think about the fine print or the details about what he was about to sign up for. And I thought, I'm, I'm thankful that he had this conversation with some people that were willing to tell him the, the reality about what he was about to volunteer for. And I thought about that story, thinking about the, the, the text of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, about when it comes to church, when it comes to the church, when it comes to a local expression of believers, do you know or, or have we looked and, and have understanding about what it is that you've signed up for? What does it mean to be part of his people and what are responsibilities that we have? And and then we're not going to cover in the next 30 minutes or so everything about church and about the, the gathering of believers, but the, the writer of Hebrews deals with this a little bit in this particular portion of chapter 10 uh, that I want us to address this morning so we can sort of put some handles on uh, or some, some beginnings of understanding about what it is that, that we have, what it is we've gathered to be, not what it is we've gathered to do, but, but who are we to be? So I thought about it this way. This morning, every one of you came this morning with a certain set of expectations. 
Some of you may be very new to this process and new to this idea of being church or being part of a group of believers. And when you, you came, you're still trying to figure out the ground rules or trying to figure out which door to come in and, and which class to go to or which uh, table at which to sit in that class. And, and, and everything, is, everything is new and you're, you're looking for some, for some help and somebody to come alongside and, and to say, let me walk with you and help you get plugged in and let's help you find where you're supposed to be. And if that's you, we are glad that you are here. But if we'll be honest, some of us have been around church for a while. And, and, and regardless of what place you go in, the, the, the furnishings might look different, the, the schedule might look different, but you sort of know what to expect. You sort of know what to, to anticipate when you come, and you come with a certain set of expectations or preconceived ideas that may be good or bad based on your experience. And if that's the case, then let me say this. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Because when we talk about expressions of church, and there's a, there's a truckload of them. Some churches are more formal. Some churches are more fancy. Some churches are more laid back. Some churches are more informal. Somebody made the suggestion earlier in conversation uh, that I wear a robe one day. Uh, nope. It's like it's enough to put on. It's hot outside. And it's enough to put on a sport coat. I've got friends, though, who, who every Sunday they put on a robe because that's their church's tradition. And, and I'm not... Uh, pro or con, I just, just know what we are. But regardless of your background or your expectation or your preconceived idea about what church is or what church is not, we're glad that you're here this morning so we can look and see some very basic understanding about who we are to be as, as church. And so look in Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. And I want you to understand how frustrating that is to begin in verse 19 of chapter 10. Because everything in me wants this morning to go back and do chapters 1 through 10 and a half or 9 and a half. So that we can get a full understanding of context. But I don't want you to do that this morning because, well, I do, but you probably don't. Because you don't want to spend four hours just to get to where we're talking about this morning. But this is the basic theme of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Because he's writing to a group of people who are wrestling with having full confidence in the gospel, thinking they need not only to accept Jesus, but then to go back and start adding some things from the law. And the writer of Hebrews lays out argument after argument after argument about the sufficiency of Jesus and the security of the believer, and Jesus is better. And then here in the latter part of the book, in these last few chapters, on the, ba on the basis or the foundation of Jesus is better in the security and the sufficiency of the gospel as people who belong to Jesus, this is what we ought to look like. And so with that, we come to verse 19. And the writer of Hebrews writes this. He says, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Now, you can, you can begin to hear in the way that the writer frames these statements that there's something being said that's going to have later repercussions. He says, since twice in the, that little portion right there. Because of these things, therefore do these things. That's the, the framework or the, or the structure of what he's saying. And he says, since we have access to God, if you're following along in your bulletin, there's a blank for you there, that since we have access to God. I want us to, to just look at those two verses for just a moment. And, and if you're familiar with these verses, let the freshness of these words rest on you. If these are new to you, hear the confidence that we can have because of what has done, been done for us by Jesus. He says, since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, the writer here is writing primarily to a group of believers who, have, who are primarily Jewish believers who would have understood everything about this temple language that he's using. 
Because when it says we have confidence to enter the holy places, first century Jews, they would have understood that the holy place was referring to that place in the temple where on the day of atonement, an offering would be made on behalf of the whole people. And that was to be accessed one time a year by one person. And that was the high priest who would go in to make atonement for all of the people. But now this writer is saying that, that we all have confidence to enter that holy place. And that holy place would, would be representative of the presence of God. I want that to land on us heavily this morning. The God who created the universe has through his son given us confident access to him. We, we are victims of familiarity where phrases like this we've heard before and we want to move past them to, th to think, okay, Brian, what am I supposed to do? What we're supposed to do is be overwhelmed by the reality that we have access to God. We just sang and proclaimed, you are good. You are good. And let the king of my heart do these things. We corporately were invited into this expression of worship that we have confidence to enter his presence because of what has been done for us. And may we not hold that so lightly or lackadaisically that we lose the reality that the God of the universe has said, I'm going to make a way for sinful creatures who have rebelled against me to come into my presence. We have access to the God of the universe who has redeemed us, who has purchased us, who has reconciled us to himself through the blood of his son. Not through us trying to work hard, not through us trying to, to be religious, but by the grand proclamation that we recognize and we know we can't be good enough. We can't be righteous enough, but that we throw ourselves at his feet and in on his mercy and his grace. And we repent of our sin and profess him as savior. And, and we follow him as our Lord. And that in that we have access to God, not just when we come together, but every moment of every day that God gives you breath in this world, he's given you access to him. And then when we go into eternity, he's promised us eternity with him. May we not hold those grand and beautiful truths so casually that we ever get over the gospel. We have access to God and not just access, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Have you ever gone someplace without certainty that you would get in? You, you, you've made preparations to go, but you did everything except confirm the thought that you're actually going to get into the place that you, that you go. If you've ever gone to a sporting event and thought, I'll get a ticket when we get there, or surely someone will be selling extra tickets on the sidewalk. I'll go up and purchase one of those. And you get there and there's none to be found. And so you went with great hope, but didn't have confidence to get in. It's a whole different feeling when you actually have a ticket in hand, is it not? Or not just ticket in hand, but you have a parking pass to park close. Well, that's a whole different confidence, isn't it? If you've got that parking ticket to get close to the venue, you drive by all the other saps who are in the long line and you kind of want to take the parking ticket and like wave it around at them so that you drive right up to the place and you've got people saying, oh, I see your ticket right this way. Come right here. There's a spot reserved for you. That's a whole different breed of attendance right there, isn't it? And then you walk up with your ticket and they say, oh, well, we've been expecting you. There's a seat waiting for you. That is a whole different thing. That is a ridiculously small illustration of what's been done here. That is a, a ridiculously insufficient picture of what has been purchased for us because Jesus has initiated and inaugurated a new and living way that it was, was purchased through the veil, that is his flesh. You see more of that temple language 
the veil that was torn at his crucifixion, his flesh that was torn through the spilling of his blood that has purchased our redemption, that has reconciled us to God, that has created this confidence in us, not in who we are, but in who he is and that his sacrifice is sufficient that we may have access to the living God. Since, therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, that one who still stands to make intercession for us, this way that has been paved by Christ, then therefore, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we have this grand statement of, of establishing the truth since these things, since we have access to God. Then it follows with three let us statements that I want us to look at this morning. We're going to see these in... in terms of responsibility. And the first thing that we can see because of these sense statements, we have responsibility of relationship. Because of Jesus making us clean as those who have been redeemed, we have the opportunity to draw near in relationship to God, but also in relationship to one another. But primarily he's talking about because we have access to God, we have the ability to hear the exhortation to draw near to him. very often talk with people who say, well, I, I know that I know Jesus, but I just don't feel very near to him. And, and, and I always want to sort of press those questions and like, well, well, tell me, tell me how your relationship with the Lord is going right now. Tell me the things that you're doing in a relationship with him. Are you, are you spending much time praying? Are you spending much time reading his word? Are you spending much time in worship or the fellowship of his, of his people? Are you spending much time using the gifts that God's given you to serve, to give back to him? And, and very often the answer is like, well, no. And, and it's not very pastoral, but sometimes I want to say, well, duh. It's not pastoral, but it's true. Well, you don't feel very near to, to Christ because you're not doing what we're exhorted to do here, to draw near to him, to draw near. The God of the universe has paved the way for you to spend time with him. I mean, what else does he need to do other than be perfect in every way and make it possible for you to know him? And not just to know about him, but to know him and to know him intimately, to know him as father and child and to enjoy fellowship and relationship with him. So the problem comes is when we approach relationships like tasks. Well, here's something we're supposed to do. It's hard for us to get out of that mentality of trying to earn things from God instead of just living in relationship with him, being used by him. Because everywhere else in life, it seems that, that we're judged or we're valued or, or our worth is deemed to be a certain level based on what we can give someone or what we can do for someone. Well, here, let me encourage us. When we come to Christ, what we're bringing him is all of our unrighteousness. All of the brokenness of who we are, we're bringing that and saying, here's, here's all of who I am. The very best of who we are, the very best we have to offer is more of a liability to God than an asset. But he takes us and lets us walk with him, lets us live in intimate fellowship with him, an intimate relationship with him, and he makes us to be people we never could be on our own. But it doesn't 
bring us to the point of working ourselves out of dependence upon him. We never, ever spiritually outgrow our need for Jesus. We never outgrow our need for absolute and ultimate dependence upon him to do anything because Jesus told his disciples, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. And so we're called, we're exhorted to draw near to him. Not just in in doing things for him, not just in being task-oriented, but but walking in relationship. Let us draw near. That picture of drawing near is a very intimate and relational statement. Because to be honest, you could work for someone and not know them. If, if some of you came and said, Brian, what are some things that, that I can do? I can give you a list of, of tasks to go and perform and you and I never have a conversation. That's not what this word is. That's not what this concept is. It's not what this invitation is. It doesn't say come work for me. It says come walk with me. Come know me. Come, come enjoy the, the, the blessing of of being redeemed and reconciled and draw near. Because of what Jesus has done, we can draw near. We have a responsibility relationally that then also begins to live itself out as we relate to one another. We have a responsibility to relationship. And in that relationship, we have a responsibility to live truthfully in the midst of that knowing. In verse 22, it says, let us draw near with a sincere heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's talking about what Jesus has already accomplished for us that allows us to walk intimately with the Father. And, and I want you to see how this works itself out. When we're walking intimately with him, the doing tends to be taken care of by the abiding. When Jesus was pressed about this when in his earthly ministry, Jesus responded this way. He said, I only say what I hear the Father saying, and I do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I see, hear the Father saying, and I do what I see the Father doing. God goes here, moves here. He went there and did that and said these things. That, that intimate relationship was modeled to us by Jesus. And there's truth that we live in here as we have responsibility to the truth. In verse 23, he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is what? Faithful. We hold fast to the confession of our hope, standing firm in the gospel without wavering because of the faithfulness of Jesus. In order to hold fast to the truth of the gospel, it is necessary to be doctrinally sound and to stand firm in all doctrine requires discipline and discipleship and study and faith. Let us hold fast to confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. He is writing here to a group of people who are struggling with having full confidence and assurance in the, the sufficiency of the gospel. They're, they're looking at doing Jesus plus. Well, I'm gonna have faith in Jesus, but I'm also gonna keep part of the law. I'm going to have faith in Jesus, but I think we also ought to require people to be circumcised. We're going to have faith in Jesus, and we're also going to, because we want to cover all of our bases. That's sort of the nature of who we are. I want to have faith in Jesus, but if there's something else I want to cover, I want to make sure I've done that a little bit too. What we're doing there is saying Jesus plus a little bit of what we do. But the reality is it's Jesus plus he doesn't need what we do. The writer of Hebrews actually early in the book says, if you're going to keep part of the law, you might as well keep it all. And you've already proven that you can't. So by rejecting the gospel, trying to keep the law, you've already proven that you can't, which shows your need for the what? For the gospel. Our own inability to keep the gospel was the purpose of the law to show us our need for Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews here says, there's a responsibility to the truth. And the truth is we desperately need Jesus. And not only to, to, to begin to enjoy the gift of salvation, but also to stand firm in that because it's the other places that often cause us to waver. It 
See, that's what I want us to, to, to catch here. When we focus on doing and we just look for a task of do and things we're supposed to do, anybody that provides a list would be sufficient. It's not about us doing. We can't add anything to our salvation. And think about this, this idea of holding fast and holding tightly to the gospel. And not just to the gospel, the confession of our hope, but also holding fast and holding tightly and, and soundly to good, strong, solid doctrine and biblical truth. Several years ago, I read the, the percentages and it was true several years ago. I don't believe that the statistics have changed dramatically. But of convent or, or converts to Mormonism in the United States, when, when they, they studied and thought, what are the, the places where people convert from this place to Mormonism? The highest percentage was from Southern Baptist background. And, and I read that and thought, how is that possible? Man, we're, we're people of the book. We're people of the gospel. We, we're the ones that have, have these organizations to send missionaries around the world and to take the gospel to people that don't know it. And we're trying to translate the Bible into languages where people can learn. And we're sending missionaries. And, and, and but yet there are people even in this, and that's just talking about in this country, there are people in this country who are part of our churches that are no more founded in the gospel than anybody offering a, a solution to trouble in marriages and morality. Anybody's good enough. Because if you hold out these things as an idol, if, if we want uh, good moral people and we want good healthy families and, and good homes, anybody that's trying to provide those things will be good enough. And there's people not living out this verse in verse 23 of holding fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, of absolutely being unmovable about the gospel. And, and, and very often people say, well, Brian, isn't that a very narrow-minded approach? Yes. I am openly, admittedly, unashamedly narrow-minded. I strive not, I don't think I'm mean. I don't try to be hateful. But, but if I'm not convinced that this is God's word and I'm not convinced that it's true and I'm not convinced that the gospel's sufficient, then, then that's problematic. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to be hard-hearted. But, but I think that, that Scripture calls us to be very narrow in our scope of what truth is. It doesn't mean we can't engage conversation, but I believe we come back to the authority of the Scripture. And especially around the gospel. We have responsibility to holding tightly to the gospel. And in that, verse 24... We not only have responsibility to truth, the relationship and truth, we also have responsibility to action and to attitude. Look in verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's where this kind of gets messy. The first two are kind of in principle. We understand the truth of the gospel and, and the personal application of that and the corporate engagement of it. Uh, and, and we understand the need to hold on to, to good, strong doctrine, to, to be dependent upon the gospel. But what does that look like when we start trying to live life together? What does that look like when we start trying to live this out in the company of other believers who might think a little differently, who might speak a little differently, who might have different backgrounds, who might have different preferences, who might have different tastes. What does it look like to assemble a group of people, even this size, and us try to live according to these truths? And let us consider then how to, how to encourage one another, how to stimulate one another, how to, to work one another in encouraging towards love and good deeds. We are called to, to encourage and engage and move one another to love and to good deeds. Well, let's stop with the first one because finally some people are like, oh, finally, good deeds, something we do. Now give me a list. I don't see enough blanks. Love. Agape. 
Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love. Okay. That word agape we've looked at before. It means that that God kind of love, that love that that desires the highest for uh, someone else, even and especially when that person is, shall we say, challenging to love. Because the, the scripture says it's easy to love people that love you. It's easy to love people who, who affirm you and who, who are for you. It's easy to love those who are loving towards you. But we're not just called to love those. We're also called to love our enemies. And I would like to think that we're not considering anybody of us enemies. But how do we, how do we stimulate one another towards love? How do we encourage one another in that way? How do we exhort one another to, to love? Well, one way we do it is to love well. To love well. To be gracious to one another. And to be gracious to one another does not invite us to let one another get away with sin or get away with treating each other poorly. It, it just means that, that we offer the same grace that we would desire and we offer the grace that Jesus has offered us. But how do we, how do we stimulate one another to, to love? How do, how do we encourage and how do we walk with one another? This is where this gets very personal and very messy and very interrupting to our schedule. How many of you are like me and you, you, you are a little frustrated by a grand interruption to what you would like to accomplish in a given time period? Where you've got this much time and you've got an idea about what this time is going to look like and, and, and then somebody feels uh, like they, that time is the time that they've set aside for you and you want to engage that time, uh, they want to engage that time for you. I'm the only one. I'm, I'm, I'll be willing to admit that. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. There will be a group after where we can encourage one another to love and to good deeds. What is it about the way that Jesus moved through the Gospels that he never seemed to be interrupted? He never, that I can tell, didn't seem purposeful. It always appeared that he had a plan of where they were supposed to go and what he was supposed to accomplish, but yet it seemed time and time and time and time again that Jesus was always being interrupted by someone. But when the agenda is people and not items, that seems much more interruptible because it never seemed like Jesus didn't have enough time to do the things that he needed to do, but it also never seemed like Jesus didn't have time for a conversation because some of the stories and the narratives that we love best from the gospel seem to be times when Jesus was interrupted in the midst of his day. When Jesus is teaching the crowds and the religious leaders bring a, a half-dressed or or maybe not dressed woman and throw her down in front and says, this lady was caught in the midst of adultery. The law says to stone her, what then do you say? Well, Jesus had to push pause on what he was doing and to deal with the thing that was in front of, you know, the issue that was in front of him. Jesus is walking from one place to another and then he's thirsty. So he goes to a well and needs a drink. And so he asks somebody for a drink and that turns into a lengthier conversation. Time after time after time after time, Jesus' day and task seemed to be interrupted with the thing that was most important. How do we stimulate one another to love and good deeds? How do we, how do we move one another to, to, li here's the real to live like Jesus models for us in the New Testament? where we encourage each other and we, we inform one another, we pray for each other, we, we challenge one another. 
But not just to love, but love then feeds this next thing to love and to good deeds. We talk about Ephesians chapter 2 where it says that, 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 that we're God's workmanship created for Christ Jesus to do good works that he planned before us. The word good deeds is well translated. There's, there's this, this overflow of loving turns into doing well for people, doing good deeds for people. Not to try to gain points, not to try to, to build momentum or to, to, to put uh, favor on us, but as an expression of love and care that we're called to do in loving. So we, so we consider, we, we pray, we think, we, we plan of how to, to love one another, to encourage one another to love, and the living out of that in good deeds. Some of those will be strategic uh, examples of service that we do individually or as a church, but then there will be other times where God just kind of gives us that opportunity in the midst of our walking through our day where he interrupts us with an opportunity to do good. And then in the midst of that, th- this is this is... This is so gracious that we're called to do this in cooperation and and in concert with one another. That it's not, we we don't just gather up here on Sunday and then we send out, go love and do good deeds and, and hope it works out for you well this week. But that we do this in this company of other believers, and that's what we're talking about in the, latter, the first part there, verse 25, that we have responsibility to this participation with one another, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Nothing about the gathering of God's people in the New Testament seems to be uh, by nature just something else to do. It, it doesn't appear to be, uh, I'm going to put this one more task on people that are already very busy, but it seems to be given for the benefit of the people who are gathering. So as we consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and living out our faith and, and standing in strong uh, doctrine and, con- and, and conviction of the truth that brings us into that full assurance, we do that together and not forsaking our own assembling as is the habit of some, but it's like as a contradictory statement, don't do this, but rather encourage one another. It almost seems the nature of the gathering is to encourage the nature of the gathering, when we come together, what, what do we do when we come together? What do we do when people come? You came this morning with a certain set of expectations. If you got here this morning and the seats were turned completely different, some of you would come unglued because then you, you would sit in your chair, but it wouldn't be in the right spot. And now you've got a decision to make. Do I want to sit in the spot that I usually sit in or the chair that I sit in? And, and you would, the, the rest of the day would be undone. Or if you came in and we didn't sing at all. Or if all we did was sing for an hour and we never opened the word. Or if we moved where we shake hands from one place to the other. Like if we didn't do it at all and then like right now I just said, well, let's just take a break. Let's have a commercial and everybody stand up and visit with a couple of people beside you. You're like, oh, that's not the right place. I understand what we're doing, but that's not the right place. Because now I've got to close my Bible, I've got to put my bulletin up, I've got to go shake hands with somebody, I've got to come back. And we're doing that without music, this just isn't right. Some of you are shuddering right now thinking, please don't do that. I've never known a good sermon that wasn't better with a commercial in the middle of it. That's why we tell stories, is you need a break. But why do, we, why do we do what we do when we come together? We, we've been talking for the last several weeks about uh, wanting everybody to be in a Sunday school class. We want you to be in a Sunday school class, not so that you have one more thing to do. We know you have enough to do. What our concern is, is that you're trying to do all those things by yourself. And, and you need a group. And the ones who right now said, I don't need a group, you're the ones who need it most because you're convinced you can do it on your own. 
We're not designed to do it on our own. We're designed for relationship. We are designed for a relationship with the Father and then being in a relationship with Him. He puts us in a relationship with one another. We're not trying to make you busy, make you busier. We're trying to encourage. So when we say we want you to be part of a, a small group, we want you to be part of a Sunday school class, we want you to be engaged in regular participation. Notice I didn't say regular attendance. I'm not interested in people attending. We're interested in people participating. Because we need it. We need one another. Being dependent upon one another is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of divine design. Whose idea was the church anyway? It was God's. He said, I want to bring my people together. And the expression of that looks different because we know what that looks like here. We kind of know what to expect. We know what uh, is basically going to happen when we come. Uh, we, we, we're, we, we sort of know what the, the process is. But, but the idea of a gathering of God's people has one expression here where we can freely gather together. But there are places in the world right now that don't have this freedom that their gathering might be maybe six or eight believers in a different home every third week. And it's not the same because they don't want to create a pattern where they can be found. But they understand that it's worth the risk to come together because we need one another. We're encouraged by one another and we want to pray for each other and we want to do the things that Hebrews chapter 10 talks about and we can't do that in isolation. We can't do that individually. We need one another. We're not trying to make you busier. We know you're busy enough. We're trying to encourage and strengthen one another because we're, we're in just a few moments, we're going to be sent into a world that largely isn't interested in what we are mandated to go tell them. Friends, we can't do it on our own. We need one another. It's not about attending. It's about participating. It's about being part of his people. Not so that we can say we had X number of people here. That's not the point. But that we would encourage one another all the more as what? As you see the day drawing near. We have this much time. Notice I didn't say this much, this much, this much. I don't know how much, however much this much is. But in that time, we have a responsibility to love one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another as we strive to live out the mandate that we have to go and take the gospel to all the ends of the earth. So we talk about this thing of church. The last thing that we're trying to do is create busyness or to, to fill up the calendar with a lot of programs. Because we know that we have a, a certain amount of, of time. And what are the ways that we can most strategically use that time to do what this talks about, to, to create an environment where we can be affirmed and confident in the truth of the gospel, in the truth of the scripture, holding fast to that confession in a world that is not terribly interested in what we're talking about, but who desperately needs it. And so that we can come together and encourage one another and think about how we can encourage one another to love and to good deeds and not forsaking the gathering together because we need it. The last thing that we want for church to be is just another place that you go or something else that you do. But that we would understand it to be that something that we can't live without because we need it. And the reality is, is that somebody here needs what you're bringing to offer. We need it and we are needed. And it's by his divine design. I want to invite you to, to pray with me.